We continue looking at special derivatives. We've looked at the derivatives of logarithms. And now we're going to look at the derivatives of functions involving inverses. And that will lead us to exponential and inverse trigonometric functions. But first, let's look at the derivatives of inverse functions to begin with. Suppose, let's explain this this way. Suppose a function, say f, has an inverse. And the inverse notation, of course, is f with the minus 1 in the superscript position. So let's suppose that a function has an inverse. Now, that means that the function, as you recall from our definitions of inverse, it means that f is a so-called one-to-one -one function. And functions that ha are one-to-one, -one, for example, are functions that are always increasing or always decreasing. So suppose we have this function that has an inverse. Let us also suppose, suppose also, that f has a derivative. Now the derivative, of course, is denoted f prime. The question that is natural to ask at this point is, does the inverse have a derivative, and is it in any way related to the derivative of the function? So what is, if it exists at all, the derivative of f inverse? That's the big question. It may or may not exist, but it's a question that we want to answer because a lot of functions are come in pairs, inverse pairs, and we'll know a lot about one of the functions. We'd like to see if we can translate that information into knowledge of the second function. So let me take you on a little journey here. Here is the idea that will lead us to the relationship. Let us begin with a graph. We'll do this graphically so we get a picture of what's going on. First, I'm going to draw in here the y equals x line. And you may remember for inverses, the y equals x line acts like a mirror. And the graph of the function and its inverse are reflected across that line. So if I draw a function here, something like this, and I call this my function f, and I pick some arbitrary point on it, say, let's call the point a, b. Then if I reflect this across, I'll have the graph of the inverse function. And the point a, b, of course, will also reflect to a point, which will be actually b, a. So let's first of all go ahead and do that reflection, since we're talking about the inverse. And there we are. The inverse function now would be this one. It would have this graph, which is exactly the reflection of the f graph. And the point a, b. If you follow it across the reflection line at 90 degrees here, perpendicularly, the point that you get up here will actually be the point BA. And I'll draw this again in a second so you'll see what I'm talking about. Now we're also interested in derivatives. So derivatives, of course, give us a formula for the slopes of tangent lines. So I'm going to draw the tangent line at these two points. So here might be the tangent line here. And let's mark that. This is the tangent line at the point AB, and of course, on the graph of f. Then let's draw the corresponding tangent line up here. And this will be the tangent line at BA. So there we have this picture, and we see the relationship between the graphs. We also see a little bit about the relationship between the tangent lines. That will be crucial for us deriving the derivative of f inverse in terms of the derivative of f. That's coming up. Let me remind you now that what we've got here, the point a under the function f goes to the point b. And of course, that makes b f of a. Then f inverse takes b and takes it backwards to a. And that now, of course, becomes f inverse of b. Now we're going to use this relationship between a and b here on the next page. So we want to keep that in mind. Here's the f inverse function. So we have this back and forth relationship between a function and its inverse. And we have this back and forth relationship between their graphs across this mirror, which is the y equals x line. So let us write down now the equations of these two tangent lines. We have a point for each one. We know that the slope of this tangent line has to be the derivative of f at this point a. And we would hope that the slope of this line is the derivative of f inverse at b, but we don't know that f inverse has an, in, 
a derivative yet, so we're going to have to check that out. So let's write this down. The tangent line at the point AB, which is on the curve F, is y minus b, the y value, equals the slope, which is f prime of a, the derivative at a, of course, x minus a, which is the first coordinate. Now, if we then at least potentially write down the tangent line for the tangent line at b of a for the function f inverse, we should get something that looks like this. It should be y minus a, because a is now the y value, equals, and here's where we have to put something we don't know exists yet, f inverse at b prime. So that's the derivative of the inverse function at b. We don't know that this exists. Times x minus b, because b is now the first coordinate here. And I'll even write here if this exists. OK, so here's how the tangent line ought to look if there is a derivative of the inverse function. Now, what we can do with this tangent line of the function f, we can reflect this tangent line, and you remember the picture, I'll bring it back in a moment, reflect through the mirror y equals x. And that amounts to, algebraically, a switch between the x and the y values. So here's the picture back again, and this tangent line is reflected across the y equals x line to become this tangent line. So that is the relationship, and whatever was x here becomes y here. Whatever was y here becomes x here. And we're going to make use of that. So I can write down the tangent line of the function f inverse by taking the tangent for f and then switching the values. So that will give me a form for the tangent line at b over a, which is different from the one over here, but should be equivalent. So if we switch the letters here, the x and the y, we have x minus b equals f prime of a times y minus a. Now over here, we have y minus a equals this expression. Here I have a y minus a. Why don't I do a little algebra and solve for it? So I now have y minus a equal 1 over f prime of a times x minus b. Well, if y minus a equals this and y minus a equals that, then these two objects must be the same. Both are multiplied by x minus b, which means the coefficients must be the same. So with these two, thus it seems, and this is the idea that leads to a theorem, it seems that if I take this derivative here, f inverse b at b, take the derivative of that, that apparently is equal to this. Now remember on the other page we had that a was equal to f inverse of b. I'm going to make that substitution now. So this becomes 1 over f prime of f inverse of b. And what we've just done is come up with a geometric justification for the theorem that's coming up. And the one thing you notice here algebraically, of course, is that the bottom must not be 0. We never divide by 0, so we have to avoid that. So we're on our way, and this is the result we were looking for. It's a little hard to see it completely here, so let's move to the next page. So, and I'll leave this theorem out. I'll just write by a theorem. It basically repeats what we just did. If a differential function, differentiable function, like our f here, f, has an inverse, Then we get, so we got an if-then statement here. Then we get exactly what we had on the other page. Let's clean it up a bit. The derivative of f inverse at x can be written as 1 over f prime f inverse at x. And that, of course, is only provided this is not 0. That turns out to be very useful. An alternate way to write this that's a little easier to remember, and we're always looking for that, if you write the function f inverse of x, if you just call it y, then this on the left becomes dy dx, and on the right this becomes 1 over, and this becomes dx dy.
And you couldn't ask for a nicer, simpler formula, an easy way to remember things, than this is. So let's even just call it nice. Now when we do problems later where we have inverses involved, if we can find the derivative of either one of the inverses by this formula, we can find the derivative of the other one. And that's why this is helpful. We've looked at inverse functions in general. Let's look at a specific case, the derivatives of exponential functions, which are, of course, inverses of the logarithmic functions. So our question here, as we look more special, at more special derivatives, is what is the derivative of b to the x, where b is greater than 0 and b is not equal to 1, as usual. So that is our question. What is that derivative? Well, as before, we'll do a development so we can go ahead and see how we can use the information we have to get a derivative of a function we've never tried before. First, we'll write y equals b to the x. And then what we'll do, because we need to get this power down since we don't know how to do the derivative of exponentials, we have to get the power down so we can use previous results. What can bring a power down? Any logarithm can. Now I will urge you throughout this course, whenever you have a choice, to always use the natural logarithm. And also, when you have a choice with exponentials, to use the base e exponentials. But here we need the logarithm, so let's hit both sides with the natural logarithm. So we get the natural log of y equals, and the whole point of this was to bring the x down, so this will be x times the natural log of b. And as I said, any, any log will do here to make this argument, but let's stay with the natural log for practice. Now we've done this preparation. We can take the derivative of both sides. This is the implicit differentiation coming back. The derivative of log of y is the derivative of the other side, x log b. Now remember, log b, although it looks complicated, is just a constant. b is a constant. Log of a constant is a constant. So that constant just sits out front of the derivative. So on the left, we get 1 over y dy dx, the chain rule being applied. On the right, the log b is a constant, so I'll just put it out front. The derivative of x, of course, is 1. So now, if we solve, we get dy dx is equal to y times log b. Now, remember, y was b to the x, and dy dx was going to be the derivative of b to the x, so we are done. We just need to write it down. Since y is equal to b to the x, we now have the result we were looking for. The derivative of b to the x is equal to b to the x natural log of b. There it is. And of course, whenever we get a derivative rule, as you know, this is just for x, the simplest possible function. We also go ahead and immediately write the generalization. If we have a function u of x, some larger function, then the derivative is exactly the same to begin with b to the u log b, but then because this function is unknown, we have to apply the chain rule, take its derivative, and so we end up multiplying by du dx. So remember again, this is the chain rule. You should remember and be keeping track of whenever it gets used. Now, there's an important case here. This is the standard rule for the derivative of an exponential. But what about the case where the exponential base is actually e, what we call the natural base? Finally, I can tell you why we call it a natural base. So this is an important case, perhaps the important case. If b is equal to e, that natural base we talked about before, then just following the rule we just found, the derivative of e to the x is going to be e to the x times the natural log of e. But the natural log is exactly the inverse of the exponential function. So the natural log of e to the 1 is 1, which means we've just discovered the first function we've ever seen whose derivative is equal to the function itself. That turns out to be a very important property of the exponential function with base e. And we'll be using this again and again. That is why e is considered natural, because this is the simplest possible derivative you could get. Nothing happens. That's what's nice about it. And of course, the generalization is that if you have e to some function of x, then you get e to the x, just repeats, or e to the u in this case, times the derivative of that unknown function. And just to give you a sample, let's go ahead and do a little example. 
These all work out the same way. If you're taking the derivative of e to, say, the x cubed plus sine x power, then because it's e to a power, you get that function right back. You just repeat it. But since the power is not just x, you have to take its derivative by the chain rule. So the derivative of that, of course, is 3x squared plus cosine x, the derivative of sine. So the derivative of e to any power is one of the easier derivatives that we'll see. Now finally here, let me give you a handy fact that will help you relate all those other b to the x exponential functions to the e to the x. This is crucial. And I'll write it out so you have a note for yourself. All exponential functions of the general form b to the x can be written in terms of the natural exponential function e to the x. Here's how it is done. It all depends on the following observation. If you have e to the x log b, now that's e to a power. Notice that x log b, you can think of the x as a power that has come down so that this might have come from e to the log of b to the x. But e and log, exponential and log, are inverses, which means this is just b to the x. So what we have here is something that you want to commit to memory. b to the x is e to the x log b. And this is with the usual provisos. b has to be greater than 0, b not equal to 1, of course. But what this allows you to do is to do all of your work with logs and exponentials using the base e exponential and the natural log. So you don't have to learn all those other rules. You just learn this relationship, and everything is in terms of e. For instance, here's a perfect example of how this can be helpful. Suppose you want the derivative, which we just calculated, remember, of b to the x. Now, I don't have to go to any lengths to remember the rule here, as long as I know what happens when I take the derivative of e to a power. Because this is the derivative, and I just replace this. They are equal, after all. e to the x log b. And now I just have the derivative of the exponential base e. Well, that just returns e to the x log b, no change, times the derivative of the upstairs. But look, log b is a constant. x is easy. So this becomes just log b. And if I remember what this is, this is b to the x. I have b to the x log b. And isn't that exactly the rule we had before? Sure it is. So this result here is a handy one to know. You want to put that in your toolbox for the rest of calculus. As a final look at derivatives involving inverses, we will look at derivatives of the inverse trigonometric functions. So we'll start with 1. And I think we'll learn what we need to, need to from this one. What is the derivative of sine inverse of x? That is the question here. So let's, again, do a development so we can find out how one might attack this question. First of all, let me rewrite this as I've done before. This is y equals sine inverse of x. That will just make it easier to think about. Now, you may not have thought about sine inverse for some time. So let's remember what this function looks like. So let's come over here and draw a little graph of it. You may recall that it is the inverse function for the sine, a restricted sine. So instead of the sine curve here, we have a flipped over version that looks something like this. And I'm marking the ends with big dots because this curve actually ends at those two points. It does not continue. And then you may remember that its limits on the x-axis are minus 1 to 1 and on the y-axis, minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. And so that means this function is defined for x greater than or equal to minus 1, less than or equal to 1. Now we're going to be interested in here in finding the derivative of this function. So we're not going to look at the endpoints, because when we take derivatives, the endpoints would have to be one-sided derivatives, and we don't want to deal with those. So we'll just look at the open interval, which means we get here a restriction on x that x will be greater than minus 1 and less than 1. So we're just leaving out the endpoints. And because we want this to be differentiable on an open interval. OK. Well, as we proceed here, I don't know how to take the derivative of the inverse, so I'm going to rewrite this so that I can use previous results. 
if y equals sine inverse of x by the definition of inverse, by the very definition of the word inverse, that means that the sine of y equals x. Since that is true, I can now attack this. There's no inverses here. I can attack this using information I already know. So let's go ahead and take the derivative of both sides of this. That's sine y on the left and the derivative of x on the right. The derivative of sine y, of course, is cosine of y times dy dx. And the derivative of x is just 1. dy dx is what we're looking for. So dy dx becomes 1 over the cosine of y. And by definition of the trig functions, this is the secant of y. And since y, remember, was equal to sine inverse of x, we can now rewrite this as saying dy dx is equal to the secant of sine inverse of x. Now that looks awfully complicated. But you may remember also that we talked about how to simplify these. So let's do that again to remind you because we need to do it here anyway, and it's good to be reminded. If you're trying to find a trigonometric function of an inverse function, the best bet is to draw a right triangle. If you draw a right triangle, something like this, say, and you mark here the angle sine inverse of x, because remember, that's what that is. The sine inverse of x is the angle whose sine is equal to x. Well, that's helpful. If the sine is equal to x for this angle, that means the opposite over the adjacent has to equal x. So write the simplest fraction, x over 1. Well, the Pythagorean theorem then gives you the third side, which is then 1, or 1 squared, minus x squared under the square root. Now I can figure out all the trigonometric functions involved with this angle. The only one I'm interested in is secant, so let's do that. Secant, of course, as we saw here, is 1 over cosine. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so secant must be the opposite, which means I have now found out what this right-hand side is. The left-hand side, remember that y is sine inverse of x, so I can write this now out all at once. The derivative, which I was looking for, of sine inverse of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. That's this 1 over this square root. And this is true for x is between minus 1 and 1. And there we have it. We have just found the derivative of the inverse sine function using our knowledge of implicit differentiation, little chain rule, remembering what the sine inverse function actually meant in terms of a right triangle. And notice here the interesting fact that the derivative of the inverse trig functions does not involve a trig function at all. There's no trig over here. That's interesting. So keep that in mind. And let's take the first step toward generalization here. So of course, this is the way you end up using it. If you have the sine inverse of some larger function u of x, then that's going to be, of course, 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared, the same as the rule says. But since the function is not just x, you need to multiply by the chain rule du dx. And again, this only makes it this true for u of x, the function, between minus 1 and 1. Now, there are six inverse trig functions. Most people use the sine inverse, the cosine inverse, and the tangent inverse. And the others, if they need them, look them up. I'll mention one more derivative here that also turns out to be useful, but I won't derive it. I'll just tell you that the derivative of tangent inverse of x is a very nice result, 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, this is nice and useful. That's why I mention it. The other trigonometric functions, the other inverse trigonometric functions, if you need their derivatives, you can go ahead and look them up and see what patterns there are. But these are the two important ones, perhaps, to keep in mind. Time again for some exercises. The first one here, as we continue again with our derivative rules, here is the function, the log of the cosine of e to the x. So we'll put the natural log, the exponential, and a trig function together and ask you to find the derivative. This derivative involves keeping track of the natural log because it's on the outside and then looking at the cosine and the exponential. Here, the natural log of a function, again, we can hide the function because the chain rule asks us only to operate on the outside function. 
So the derivative of the natural log of something is always 1 over that something, which is cosine of e to the x here. It doesn't matter how complicated it is, it's 1 over that something. Now, having done that, I now have to take the derivative of that something, in this case, cosine of e to the x, which involves the chain rule itself. This is the cosine of something. So first of all, I deal with the cosine. And the derivative of the cosine of something is minus the sine of that something. In this case, it's e to the x. Now that's the outer part. Now I can look at the inner part and ask the derivative of e to the x. Well, that's the easiest derivative that exists. It's just e to the x. And so we're done. If we want to simplify this a little bit, we can take this minus sine and the e to the x and pull them out front. And then notice that sine over cosine of something equals tangent. So this is tangent of e to the x, if you wanted to clean that up a little bit. So there's a little example of doing a derivative. Let's do another one just to practice a bit. What would be the derivative of sine inverse of cosine of x? Try that one. This problem actually has a bonus because there's a nice graph at the end. But let's first do the derivative as we were asked. Again, it's the derivative of something of something, so it's a chain rule problem. And uh, we have sine inverse of cosine x, so we'll forget about the cosine x for now. We'll just hide it and worry about taking the derivative of sine inverse. The derivative of sine inverse is, let's see, 1 over the square root of 1 minus whatever's in here squared. So that's cosine squared of x here. Times, now with the chain rule, we look at the derivative of the inside, which is cosine. And that's going to be minus sine of x. And that's the end of it. However, there's something here that can be simplified, and you should notice it. 1 minus cosine x squared, that should remind you of a familiar identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, so that means this is sine squared under here. And then sine squared under the square root can be simplified, so we have minus sine x on the top. And if you take the square root of sine squared, be careful, you get the absolute value of sine x. Now, this function here is going to have three different values, or two different values, and an undefinition, depending on circumstances. It is minus 1 when the sine of x is positive, because if it's positive, it's positive here, positive here, and the minus stays. It is undefined when the sine of x is equal to 0. And finally, it's 1 when the sine of x itself is negative. So when it's negative, the bottom becomes negative sine x. The absolute value has to make it positive. The two negatives cancel and give you a 1. So there is the answer as far as the function goes. But let's look at the graph of this. This is kind of a nice picture. And you should always, I've said this before, when you're doing calculus, draw as many pictures as you can. That's the best way to understand calculus ideas. So y here is minus sine x over the absolute value of sine x. And to see what's going on here, what I'll do is I'll just sort of dot in the sine function. I'll do that on the right and the left a little bit. And remember, the sine function goes up to 1. It goes down as far as minus 1. And then it crosses the x-axis at various points. And remember, the conditions on the definition of this all depended on where sine x was positive and negative. And if you remember, when sine was positive, the function here was negative 1. And it's undefined at all these points where it's 0. So those are open dots. And then wherever the sine of function is uh, negative, the derivative is 1. So we have this sort of a picture. So this continues wherever it is uh, negative, it is going to be a positive height here at 1, and so on in both directions. We have this infinite step function, which is a nice picture that you might not have expected from taking that derivative at the beginning. Now we're going to use the derivative to find limits. You may remember that we defined the derivative originally using limits, so this is a nice turnabout. And we'll find a very important rule here that will allow us to take the limits of quotients that appear to be undoable or indeterminate. So we'll be looking at limits of quotients that appear to be indeterminate. And this is the famous rule of L'Hopital. So in order to begin, 
let's first look at what we've done previously in the case of quotients and finding limits of quotients. Here is the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Now that's a standard rational function and we know how to take this limit. But before we do, notice that this has, if we just look at it as it stands, the form, it has the 0 over 0 form. That is to say it is indeterminate. That's the official word we're going to use here. It is indeterminate. It looks like if you let x be 1 at the top and at the bottom you get 0 over 0, which of course is a meaningless expression. Now, as I said, we know how to do this limit because we use a little bit of algebra to rewrite the top by factoring x squared minus 1. We have the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 1 times x plus 1 all over x minus 1. And then, of course, x minus 1 over x minus 1 is 1. Algebra again simplifies this to the limit of x plus 1 as x approaches 1. And, of course, as x approaches 1, this is a continuous function. We can just substitute in the 1, and we get 2. So it turns out that this limit is doable, even though on the surface, at first glance, it appears to be indeterminate. Now, it will turn out there are many limits of this form, and we will not always be lucky enough to have algebra at our beck and call to finish the limit. Let's look at another example. This is a famous one that we did before, and it took us quite a bit of work. We had to use a lot of geometry. This is sine x over x. And you may remember that by a geometric argument, we discovered that this limit was 1. Again, this is a 0 over 0 form. And without that geometric argument, we might not have been able to do this limit and prove that it's equal to 1. Finally, here's one more, just to show you what kinds of things that can happen here. Limit as x goes to infinity of x over e to the x. Now this one, there's no algebra that we can do here, and we've never done this with a geometric argument. You might do it, say, by a graphical argument. If you look at the graph of this, you'll see that the limit has to be 0. Now that's not very satisfactory, but again, this is another indeterminate sort of form, except this one is an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. Because as x goes to infinity, both the top and the bottom go to infinity. Again, this is meaningless, so we need some other means, some other theory to take us to zero, as we did here to go to one and to two. But having three different techniques is, is awkward. It would be nice if we had a single technique that would hit all of these at once. And it turns out that we do. This is a really nice question to be asking. Is there a general tool? And the answer is yes. That's a very famous tool. And before I tell you what it is, why don't I do a little bit of a motivational argument and see if we can get ourselves built up to it. So let's suppose we have, uh, as our first assumption, let's suppose we have a situation where we are looking for the limit of the quotient of two functions, f of x over g of x, as x approaches, well, let's just say a for the moment. And let's suppose that that limit has the 0 over 0 indeterminate form. So what does that mean? That means, meaning, that both the limit of the top, the limit of f of x as x approaches a is 0, and the limit of the bottom of g of x as x approaches a also equals 0. Okay? So that's our setup. We will assume that this limit is a 0 over 0 form. Now let's make one other assumption, which is what will make the theorem work, the rule that we're about to come up with, this second assumption. And we will suppose simply, and this is not a very difficult assumption, we'll suppose that f and g are both differentiable or have derivatives at a. So I'll write differentiable at that number a. So this is all that we're assuming, that we have the 0 over 0 situation occurring and that these two functions have derivatives. Now, notice that we have a piece of information from earlier in calculus that if a function has a derivative at a point, it automatically is continuous at a point. So let me just make that note here that f 
and G are both continuous at the point A. So that means that if you take the limit of f of x as x approaches a, you get f of a because with a continuous function you can substitute in x a for x and end up with f of a. That's what continuity means. Likewise, the limit as x approaches a of g of x is going to give you g of a. But we've already discovered that these two limits by our first assumption are zero, so from this we conclude that f of a is zero and that's the same thing as g of a. Now, remember I'm trying to motivate a general tool for finding this kind of a limit where we have a zero over zero form and all we have assumed so far is that we have this kind of limit and the two functions have a derivative. Now, where is this leading you may ask? Well, here's where it's leading and this happens right away. Observe, this is simple algebra f of x over g of x is the quotient we're interested in finding the limit of. Let me just rewrite this little algebra. This is f of x minus f of a over g of x minus g of a. Now remember, f of a is 0 and g of a is 0. That's what I noted on the previous page. And let me do one more algebraic simplification, or it's not a simplification, I guess, it's just a rewriting, because this is certainly not simpler. Let me divide the top and bottom by x minus a. So this becomes f of x minus f of a over x minus a. And on the bottom we get g of x minus g of a over x minus a. Now remember, in the limit x will be approaching a, which means x minus a is not zero at this time. Now the question one might ask is why would I make something simple into something difficult? Well, here's what you want to notice. As I take the limit here as x approaches a, which is the limit I am looking for, that is equal to me taking the limit here as x approaches a. But these are exactly the right difference quotient forms for me to get the derivative of f on the top and the derivative of g on the bottom. Which means that it appears that the limit of f of x over g of x is the same thing as the limit of the derivative of f over the derivative of g. That's exactly what this rule is going to tell us. And that will be where the power of the rule comes from. So with that motivation in mind, let me write down this theorem. This is well known. It's usually called L'Hopital's Rule. L'Hopital's Rule. And I will write here that this is for the 0 over 0 form, although we will extend it in just a moment. Now, it's called L'Hopital's Rule because it appeared in the very first textbook of calculus, written by L'Hopital in 1696. The rule itself, although L'Hopital included it in there, is not really a piece of his work. It's actually from Johann Bernoulli, who allowed L'Hopital to use it in his textbook. So, a little bit of history there. But this is from the very first calculus textbook, so that's kind of fun. All right, so what we want to have here is a theorem that says, under certain circumstances, I will be able to find that limit that I don't know how to find at this point. Now, what did we have as assumptions? Well, we had two assumptions. One of them is that f and g have to be differentiable. They have to have derivatives. And it turns out they can be differentiable on, and I'll just draw it, on an open interval containing A. They don't even have to have a derivative at A, as you'll see in a moment. They have to be differentiable, though, on an open interval around A. That's one of our two assumptions. And the other one is that both have limits, of course, as x approaches A, that are 0. Limit of f of x is 0, and the limit of g of x as x approaches a is 0. So under those conditions, the result of this theorem is that the limit of the quotient, f of x over g of x, as x approaches a, which is the one we want to find, and this is the 0 over 0 limit that we want, Okay, The theorem, and I'll just write L of H here, this is where the heart of the theorem is. The theorem says that this limit, which we don't know how to do, and which is indeterminate, is in fact the same thing as the limit as x approaches a of the derivative of f over the derivative of g, as my motivation a moment ago suggested. Now, 
what is this? This is a limit we hope exists because as you know limits don't always exist we hope it exists and I guess more importantly once it exists we hope it is easier to calculate that's the whole point here that this original limit is equal to this new limit and the original limit is hard because it's an indeterminate form whereas this new limit might be easier to calculate and as you know from your experience derivatives are often easier than the original function and then we might be able to find this limit which means we're finding the original limit too so this is what the theorem says this equality here just as a note in passing I should say that although I wrote x approaches a which is the two-sided limit x approaching a from both sides throughout it turns out this theorem applies if you approach a from one side or the other side or if a happens to be plus or minus infinity saying that x grows without bound to the right or to the left now let me say one other thing L'Hopital's rule for zero over zero it turns out the same rule same result also applies to the infinity over infinity case so L'Hopital's rule I'll just abbreviate it that way also applies to the infinity over infinity form indeterminate form and uh, sometimes there's a plus or a minus associated with this that does not affect the result of this theorem so L'Hopital's rule is more general than just zero over zero it imply it applies also to infinity over infinity and we'll see many examples of that coming up but before we get there let me give you one warning about a standard mistake the students make in applying L'Hopital's rule so we can get that out of the way and you can avoid it here's a calculation warning in L'Hopital's rule we need to have f prime of x over g prime of x that is to say one derivative over another you may remember that that can also be written as d dx of f of x over d bar dx of g of x just other notation the point to be made here is that this is not the same thing as taking the derivative of the quotient the derivative of f over the derivative of g is not the derivative of the quotient and you know this because if you take the derivative of the quotient and you apply the quotient rule let's see I get g of x squared on the bottom then g of x f prime of x minus g prime of x f of x on the top and surely this far right expression is not the same as the far left expression so be very careful this side here is what the L'Hopital's rule uses this side over here is not what it uses let me write this one more way you can just say this in English that the quotient of derivatives which is what we have here on the left is not equal to the derivative of a quotient the derivative of a quotient now that's a classic mistake the students make by assuming those are the same and they're not so don't you be, make that mistake you be careful and you won't have any difficulty applying L'Hopital's rule we'll pause there for you to collect your thoughts on this let's look at some examples of L'Hopital's rule in action so first let's go ahead and recall that famous limit that we've already looked at the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x now we know the answer is one but let me show you how quickly you can do this using L'Hopital's rule first you should note as always that this is a zero over zero form and I'm going to say you want to mark L'Hopital's rule over the equal sign where it is applied I'll get back to this if we do apply it we now have the limit as x approaches zero of what well in the quotient we take the derivative of the top the derivative of sine is cosine the derivative of the bottom the derivative of x is one so this becomes the limit of cosine x cosine x is continuous so the zero gets substituted in this is the cosine of zero and that's one look how fast that was you have to remember when we did this originally we did this with an elaborate geometric argument we don't have any of that here L'Hopital's rule just knocks it out in one step now as a matter of form 
let me indicate a couple of things that you should always do to make sure that you don't make mistakes as you're working. Always indicate somewhere at the beginning what the form is. That will make a difference in whether or not L'Hopital's rule applies. And as you see later, this form will change. Secondly, always write LH, or something like that, over the equal sign to indicate that L'Hopital's rule is being applied. It's not an obvious step, and you should alert your reader, and of course the first reader is always you, alert your reader that you have used L'Hopital's rule. All right, let's look at some more examples to extend your base of knowledge of how this works. Let's take the limit as x goes to 0 of e to the x minus 1 over x cubed. Again, we first verify that this is a 0 over 0 form. We see that by letting x go to 0. We have e to the 0, which is 1 minus 1, and on the bottom we get 0. Always verify that you have the correct form. L'Hopital's rule doesn't apply unless it's in this form or infinity over infinity. So in this form, this now applies. So I'm going to write L'Hopital's rule, and I have the limit as x approaches 0. The derivative of the top, derivative of e to the x, is e to the x. Minus 1, of course, has the derivative of 0. And the bottom is 3x squared. Now, note that this is not indeterminate. This is no longer indeterminate. As x goes to 0, the top goes to 1. The bottom goes to 0. That means that this is going to go to plus infinity. That is to say, it grows without bound, because the bottom is going towards 0, while the top remains constant. So when you end up in a situation like this, remember, L'Hopital's rule doesn't just get applied over and over and over. It only is applied where you have the correct form. And once you've done it, you might not need to do it again. Here's another case as we build up a collection of examples here. Suppose we take the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of 1 minus sine x over cosine x. Now again in this one, this is a 0 over 0 form. How do I know that? As x goes to pi over 2, this goes to 1 minus sine of pi over 2, which is 1, so that's 0. And the bottom goes to cosine of pi over 2, which is also 0. So L'Hopital's rule applies. And I end up with the limit as x approaches pi over 2 of, let's see what we get here. The derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of sine is cosine, so it's minus cosine x on top. The derivative of cosine is minus sine x. And now this is no longer indeterminate. This is, again, not indeterminate. See, I keep saying this because it's very easy to just keep trying to apply L'Hopital's rule without thinking, and you always want to think when you apply it that you're applying it to a form that is appropriate. So what do we have here as x goes to pi over 2? Cosine of pi over 2 on the top is just 0. The bottom sine of pi over 2 is 1, so that's minus 1. And of course, that gives me 0. So there are three examples. And just in passing, let me note that although all three of these are 0 over 0 forms, which some naive student might think is equal to 1, you'll notice that they came up with three different numbers here. All right. Here's another example. x squared over e to the x. And this one, as x goes to infinity. Here we have infinity over infinity as the form. So L'Hopital's rule applies. This is the limit as x goes to infinity. We take the derivative of the top, which is 2x, the derivative of the bottom, which is e to the x. This is still infinity over infinity. I'll write still infinity over infinity. So L'Hopital's rule applies again. And in doing so, we get the limit as x goes to infinity. On the top, we now get 2. On the bottom, we still have e to the x. Now, L'Hopital's rule no longer applies. This is not indeterminate. As x goes to infinity, the bottom goes to infinity. So this goes to 0. All right. While we're on this particular example, let me mention something. This gives us a way to compare the growth of functions. And what do I mean by that? Suppose you have two functions that go to infinity, as x goes to infinity, for example. 
That tells you something about the functions, but it doesn't tell you which one goes to infinity faster. Is there a way to tell? Yes, there is. If you take the quotient of the two and look at the limit of that quotient, you will have an answer to that question. I will just do one example here, although you can do this with all sorts of functions. Let's suppose we have the limit as x goes to infinity of x to the n over e to the x. Now n is any positive integer. Up here we did x squared. Let's just suppose x to the n is the general case. Notice that this is an infinity over infinity form. As x goes to infinity, both the top and bottom go to infinity. Now, if I want to apply L'Hopital's rule, when I take the derivative of the top, I'm going to get n x to the n minus 1, whereas the bottom's derivative will not change. In order for the top to get rid of all the x's, just as we did up here when we went from x squared to 2x to 2, I would have to apply L'Hopital n times. And if I do that, I will end up with the limit as x goes to infinity of n factorial over e to the x. Now n factorial is a constant with respect to this variable x, so this is going to be going to zero since the bottom goes to infinity. So we conclude here that e to the x grows faster than any x to the n power. Because no matter what x to the n you have up here, the e to the x is going to go off to infinity faster than this one, and hence the fraction here will head towards zero. So now we have a handy way to tell which one of two functions that are going to infinity is going there faster. And you can do this with lots of functions, as I said. I will not do any more right here. Let me go on and show you one more example of L'Hopital's rule in action to make another point. Suppose we have the limit as x approaches 0 from above of the natural log of x over cosecant of x. Now if you look at this carefully, this is another 0, well, excuse me, infinity over infinity form. In fact, if you want to be careful, it's minus infinity over plus infinity. But that doesn't matter in the limit, and it doesn't matter to L'Hopital's rule. So we usually don't bother writing down whether there are negatives or positives here. We just call it infinity over infinity generically. Now, why is that so? Well, natural log, remember, as you approach the x-axis from the right, the natural log goes down to negative infinity. The cosecant, of course, being 1 over sine, goes up to infinity. Now, L'Hopital's rule applies, so let's go ahead and apply it. We take the limit as x goes to 0 from above. The top, the derivative of log x, is 1 over x. The bottom, the derivative of cosecant, is minus cosecant x times cotangent x. Now this is looking a little more complicated. It is still infinity over infinity, so we're going to have to do L'Hopital's rule again. But wait a minute. Is that a correct conclusion? If I leave this the way it is, I'm correct. I would have to use L'Hopital's rule again. But let me give you a piece of advice. When something is complicated, simplify if it's complicated, and hope that by simplification you will eliminate the need for L'Hopital's rule. Let's try that here. If I simplify this, because who wants to have a fraction like this on the top? I'm going to get, and this is strictly algebra now, there's no L'Hopital's at this point, the limit is x approaches 0 from above. If I simplify this, and remembering that cosecant is 1 over sine, and cotangent on the bottom is just tangent on the top, this becomes minus sine x over x times tangent x. Well, I know what that is because I know the derivative of sine x over x as x approaches 0. That's 1. So this with the minus sign is minus 1. Tangent, as x goes to 0, becomes tangent of 0, which is 0. So I have a limit of 0. No L'Hopital needed. So there is a moral here that although L'Hopital's rule may be applicable at some part of a problem, as you move further on, consider the possibility that if you simplify complicated expressions, you might end up not having to use L'Hopital's rule at all. And that's wise. We'll stop now before we do some more examples.
L'Hopital's rule also applies to other indeterminate limits. So let's go ahead and look at some of those. Let's remind ourselves. L'Hopital's rule, and there's my abbreviation, applies directly to forms 0 over 0 and infinity over infinity. That's what the theorem actually says. Can we extend it to apply to other indeterminate forms? And by the way, what are these indeterminate forms? Why do we call them indeterminate? So let me go ahead and write this out. This also applies to other indeterminate forms, and here they are. Infinity times zero. Infinity minus infinity. One to the infinity. Zero to the zero and infinity to the zero. Why are these called indeterminate? The reason any of these, including the original ones, are called indeterminate is that there seem to be rules that are in conflict. Zero over zero, infinity over infinity ought to be one if these were actual real numbers. But we've already seen that these don't necessarily turn out to be one in the limit. Infinity times zero, well, the zero suggests that this should go to zero, whereas the infinity says it should blow up. You can't have it both ways. Same thing with many of these others. Zero to the zero is a classic. Zero multiplied by itself suggests that it should be zero. But if the zero power suggests that it should be one. These forms, and they're only forms, remember, they're things that limits seem to be going toward, are all indeterminate for those reasons. Now, how can we handle these? Well, let me show you a handy chart to reduce any indeterminate form, and that's any of the ones above, any indeterminate form to either of the ones that L'Hopital applies to directly. That is 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity. So this is what I want to show you. It's a handy chart to make that happen. And once you remember this, it makes it easier to know how to take these indeterminate forms and turn them into these quotient forms which L'Hopital applies to. So let's start up here at the top with the ones that need the most work. 1 to the infinity, 0 to the 0, and infinity to the 0. Now as you might expect, the first thing that has to happen with these forms is that the powers have to come down. And what brings powers down? The log function. So there are two ways you can use the log function here. Well, it depends on what happens after you use the log function. If you use the log function, say, and you are lucky, so I apply the log function here. If I'm lucky, I will end up with 0 over 0 or infinity over infinity directly. If that's the case, L'Hopital rule applies, and we can continue. However, it's possible that that won't happen. It's possible that you will apply the log, but you will not end up with these directly. What you might end up with are 0 times infinity or infinity minus infinity. Well, what do you do in those cases? Well, in order to get to the stage where you have these quotients, turns out all you have to do is a little bit of elementary algebra. So there is your entire chart. If you start out with one of these indeterminate forms and apply the natural log, either you will get directly to the form L'Hopital applies to, or you'll end up with these intermediate forms, and then you'll have to use some algebra to get to these forms that L'Hopital applies to. So with that in mind, we'll go ahead now and look at some examples of how these can be worked out. Here is the first one. Consider the limit as x goes to infinity of x times the sine of 1 over x, and ask ourselves, what does that go to? Well, if we try to put infinity in here to see what kind of form we have, it looks like we have infinity where x goes to infinity times. And what happens here is x goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to 0. This goes to sine of 0, which is 0. So it looks like we have an infinity times 0 form. That's one of those intermediate forms. In order to reduce it, we're going to have to do some algebra. And the algebra is simply 
In order to get a quotient, just rewrite this so it's a quotient. And always the rule is try and leave the hard part on top. So sine of 1 over x I'll leave on top. Bring the x underneath and that becomes 1 over x. Now, this is 0 over 0. And what we've done is we've changed this infinity times 0 into 0 over 0. Now L'Hopital's rule applies directly. So this is L'Hopital's rule. The limit as x goes to infinity. The top, we take the derivative of sine of 1 over x, that's cosine of 1 over x, times the derivative of the inside, which is minus 1 over x squared, over the derivative of 1 over x, which is another minus 1 over x squared. Those two uh, over each other are equal to 1, so this is the limit as x goes to infinity of cosine of 1 over x. As x goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to 0. This goes to the cosine of 0, which of course is 1, and we're done. So, you see here how the algebra moves from here to here. And you have to think of algebra here as putting it in the right form for L'Hopital's rule. It actually makes this more complicated. This is nice and simple. This is now a quotient, which we didn't have before. But the quotient is advantageous because that's where L'Hopital's rule kicks in. All right, let's look at another example. Example here. The limit as x approaches 1 of 1 over the natural log of x minus 1 over x minus 1. Now, if we look at what happens as x goes to 1, log of 1 is 0, so this goes to 1 over 0. That's going to be infinity minus, and again, the same thing here, 1 over 1 minus 1 goes to infinity. So what we have here is an infinity minus infinity form, another indeterminate form. The chart said do algebra here. What is the natural algebra? Well, combine this into a single fraction. So this becomes the limit as x approaches 1. Combining this into a single fraction, we get x minus 1 minus log x all over log x times x minus 1. Now, this is in 0 over 0 form. So we have just changed this indeterminate form into one where L'Hopital's rule applies. Because as x goes to 1, you see, x 1 minus 1 is 0, and log of 1 is 0, and then the same thing happens on the bottom. So, applying L'Hopital's rule, we get the limit as x approaches 1. We take the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. On the top, we get 1 for the x. The minus 1 is 0. The derivative of log x is 1 over x. On the bottom, we have a product, so we need the product rule. So we have 1 over x times x minus 1 plus the natural log of x times 1. We do a little bit of simplification here. This is just more algebra. The top is 1 minus 1 over x, no change there. The bottom we just multiply through and clean it up. 1 minus 1 over x plus log x. Again, this is a 0 over 0 form, so we can, if we want, use L'Hopital's rule. As x goes to 1, we get the limit. The top, the derivative of 1, of course, the top and the bottom is 0. The derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared. There is a minus there, so it's 1 over x squared. On the bottom, then, we get 1 over x squared plus 1 over x. This is no longer indeterminate. If we put 1 in there, because this is just a rational expression, we end up with 1 over 1 plus 1. In other words, 1 half, and we are done. So in this one, we change an infinity minus infinity to 0 over 0 using algebra, as I said in the chart before. All right. Now, one final example. This will address, really, all of the power forms. What do I mean by that? I mean the 1 to the infinity, 0 to the 0, infinity to the 0 forms. This is really a standard technique. This will apply to any one of those cases, although I'll just illustrate it with one of them. Remember, the idea from the chart is that you want to bring the powers down, so you want to hit these all with the natural log first, and then go ahead and take the limits. So let's start. Here is the function we have for this example, which is very general, 1 plus 1 over x to the x. 
Now what we want to do is find the limit of this function f of x as x goes to infinity. Now what form will this have? This will have a 1 to the infinity form. Now let me verify that for you. As x goes to infinity, the power becomes infinity, of course. That's clear. Inside 1 over x, the, as x goes to infinity, this part goes to 0, leaving 1. So this is a 1 to the infinity form. All right. How do you attack this as a general rule? Well, first there's some preparation before you ever get to the limit. Preparation before the limit. So this is before you take the limit. Just first write the function down. f of x is 1 plus 1 over x to the x. And each one of these lines, remember, is a sentence. And what I'm doing here is establishing a pattern that if you follow every time you're faced with one of these indeterminate forms, you will be able to calculate them. So you write the function down, f of x equals whatever it is, in this case 1 plus 1 over x to the x. Hit both sides with the natural log. So you just write natural log on both sides. Now on the right hand side where the function is, use the natural log properties, says the power can come down out front. So this is x times the natural log of 1 plus 1 over x. Okay, so I've got first sentence here, this is my second long sentence here. And then let me write this right hand side in such a way that I'll be prepared to use L'Hopital's rule because I need a quotient for that. Finally then I end up with log of f of x on the left, on the right again taking the rule that I leave the hard part on top, log of 1 plus 1 over x, I put then 1 over x on the bottom, this is the same as the previous expression, but now this is in the form of a quotient. And I am now ready to take the limit as x goes to infinity. So let me do that. And I have the limit of, on the left I had log of f of x, and I'm taking as x goes to infinity. On the right I have the limit as x goes to infinity. And I had natural log of 1 plus 1 over x, all over 1 over x. And we now observe that this is of the 0 over 0 form. Because as x goes to infinity, of course, 1 over x goes to 0. Goes to 0 on the top, leaving me with log of 1, which is 0. So I have the correct format. Now, here is something where we can work on both sides of the expression at once. Very nice. Since this is 0 over 0, I know I'm going to use L'Hopital's rule to get to the next stage. What I want to do on this side is something also that is going to be needed, but this is the right place to do it. It turns out that I have here limit of log of f of x. I can reverse those. Rewriting this as the log of the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x. Why can I do that? Well, first let me show you what I've done. Schematically, I've just done a switch. So this is a switch. Why can I do that? Because the function log is continuous. And because it's continuous, you can take the limit inside. You can do that with any continuous function. But in all of these problems involving the power forms, indeterminate forms, you'll be using the log, and this is always legitimate. You can switch these two. Now you'll see later what good that is. But that's the reason that works. Now, for this part, since it's 0 over 0, I'm going to apply L'Hopital's rule. And I get the limit as x approaches infinity. Now I've got to take the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of the log of something, first of all, is 1 over that something. So it's 1 over 1 plus x times the derivative of 1 plus 1 over x, which is minus 1 over x squared. The derivative on the bottom is the derivative of 1 over x, which is also minus 1 over x squared. So there is the result of L'Hopital's rule. I've got a lot of simplification because I've got minus 1 over x squared on the top and the bottom. That's 1. So I end up here with just the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over 1 plus 1 over x. And as x goes to infinity, 1 over x goes to 0, so this goes to just 1. So it turns out I'm going to get a 1 here. Let me go ahead and rewrite this left-hand side, the log of the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x, just to keep caught up here. Now, I want this limit. That's what I'm looking for. I don't want to have the log out front. 
So all I will do is exponentiate. And the base here, of course, is e. And that, that will give me the limit of f of x. As x approaches infinity will equal e to the 1. Raise both sides to the e power. Well, then if I rewrite this first one to rewrite what f of x is, remembering from the beginning, we get a nice clean answer that says the limit as x approaches infinity of, here's what f of x was, 1 plus 1 over x to the x equals e. So I have managed to do this limit from an indeterminate form of 1 to the infinity. Remember this was a 1 to the infinity form. And I've managed to do this limit with this process. So you want to pay attention to this process and use it in every case where you have a power like this. This, by the way, is a well-known limit because it is a way of calculating E. So with that note, we'll stop there in our analysis of L'Hopital's rule.